So um, let's talk about shooting the pilot for Barney Miller. Barney Miller. So um, two pilots. So tell two us Two pilots. About that. The first pilot was shot. Uh, I was doing uh, the pajama game on Broadway, and my agents, God bless them, had put in a clause that I had to be uh, let go to if I got a pilot. And sure enough, I got a pilot, and they had to not just let out of the show. I didn't leave the show. I was ready. I went back to it, but at least I had the opportunity. I didn't have to turn down a, a pilot. Got the pilot for Barney. Uh, different cast. Different cast. Good cast. Uh, it was called The Life and Times of Captain Barney Miller and was intended to be originally a balance between the life in the precinct and the life at home. So I had a wife, uh, Abby, Abby, what was her name? I don't have her name. Oh, please. Dalton? Um, Is that what she was? Abby Dalton? Abby Dalton. Abby Dalton. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Abby. <laughs> I remembered Abby. Uh, and uh, uh, two kids. And that was the pilot. That was the first pilot. It, it didn't sell. It didn't sell. It was shown that August in the ABC Comedy Theater, which was the re repository for dead pilots. Uh, and I thought that was over with. Danny Arnold was not to be denied. He had confidence in it, or the concept, or he recognized also that the better part of it was the detective story part in this squad room. And so uh, it just became Barney Miller. Uh, I, uh, legend has it, he, he told me that he was driving along and the next guy in the next car was a friend of his from, uh, I think, Columbia. I, I, I don't know exactly who it was. You'd have to ask uh, the people on the inside. Uh, but he uh, managed to get uh, a shot at a second at, at two more, two more episodes. Uh, the amazing thing about Danny was that he had such confidence in it he mortgaged his home and bought back the investment of the deficit financer. Personally bought back, thus giving him majority ownership. Uh, it was a kind of an uncomfortable partnership with, with another writer that I think believe William Morris had put together. He now had control of it. He told the partner to stay home, and he wrote two more episodes, and we did two episodes, and, and he didn't have any contracts with anybody. He called me up, and um, would I come and do two more episodes? Uh, it was interesting. I, uh, I had an offer for a Broadway musical. It was called Dr. Jazz, I believe. Uh, I think I was playing a musician. It was perfect for me. It was a very exciting role. Uh, and I had to make my mind up. All it was was two episodes. Give up a whole year's work, really, you know, with rehearsal and out of town, and uh, you're talking half a year anyway, even if it's a bomb. And I couldn't make my mind up. I remember sitting in my manager's office on it was Friday. The Broadway producer had called and said, we have to have an answer by close of business Friday. And I sat in my, and he looked across the desk. He said, you got to make your mind up. What do you want to do? And I said, this cavalierly. All right, we've done Broadway. Let's try television. That was <laughs> as 
that were, I, 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 I use the word cavalierly. And uh, on that, we went out and did the two, ep the two new episodes, Recast. Barbara Barry was now my wife, and uh, no kid. Oh yes, we did have kids eventually. I think they showed up, but it wasn't. It was now called Barney Miller. It was not about the home life. The home life was only the backstory or the, the side stories. Uh, had to recast all the parts. The only part that was the same was Abe Bogota. Uh, Max Gale was new. Ron Glass was new, Ronnie Carey was new, uh, Jack Sue, I, think, I think only showed up in one episode. I, uh, he wasn't even a regular to begin with. And we did the two episodes, and uh, that got us a, a mid-season replacement, um, which led to eight terrific seasons. So let's talk about the character of Barney Miller. Describe him. Uh, calm, very, very restrained, very in control of, of the situation, or, or as much as he could stay in control, and as calm as he could remain. Uh, I remember uh, going, when we got to the set, uh, I'm walking around my office looking at the pictures that the uh, uh, set designers had put on the walls, and there was a picture of a graduation, and I'm, you know, I'm writing the stories that behind every picture, and uh, and then we, I remember we had dinner with Danny when he told me about. His, th that attitude of Talmudic justice. And I said, then Barney's Jewish? He said, yes. I had to go back into the room now and give everybody else, give them new names. <laughs> you know, this, this was my Uncle Jack, who was the, uh, uh, my, who was a cop and was my inspiration for becoming a cop. He's now Uncle Nathan, you know. I just changed, you know, I had to redo them to, to accommodate. Uh, I, I, I never did, I was never sure about Barney, even as I started doing it, uh, until I recognized his, his function in the piece, and then you accommodate the character to the function. Uh, Barney was the, uh, was indeed the, the, the comparison. The calmness in the storm, the sanity in the insanity, uh, the audience's eye, if you will. I looked balefully at somebody's behavior in the name of the audience who would sit and watch it and look balefully at that behavior or or whatever reaction. So I had, uh, that obviously became my function uh, for eight terrific years. We, uh, the amazing thing about, about Barney was, uh, well, first of all, it was done differently from any other sitcom, specifically at, at the time. And it was done differently specifically to maintain quality control. And that, 100% due to Danny. I had no experience in the medium, so I didn't. Un I wouldn't have known. But Danny was a real stickler. And he, as he put it many times, the only reason to do this show is to do it as well as we can. And I can tell you this. I've said this before. We never walked away from a show saying we'll do better next week. Never. If, if it didn't work, he stayed there until it did work. And you could only do that if you had the kind, kind of control that Danny insisted on, which meant um, 
it was not it was not done in front of an audience. It was done under, as I said, under control. But we had where he had control of it. Was it originally shot in front of a live? audience? It was originally shot in front of a live audience. It was supposed to be uh, the first um, the first pilot that we did was shot on film, multi camera film. And Danny, who was an editor by uh, prior experience, uh, you know, put it together. Uh, when we redid it, they they wanted to go to tape, so we went to tape, which he did not have experience with. So when we did our, our first show, for instance, which was done the traditional way, three days of rehearsal, a day of camera blocking, and then two shows in front of an audience. Uh, when the two shows were over, Danny wasn't sure what he had, so he said, let's do another run without the, after the audience gone to make sure that he's got the shot that he wants. You know, he didn't want to have to go into the editing room and find out he doesn't have a reaction shot that he would normally have. So we did it a third time. And that was the way we did it for about three weeks. Until finally somebody said, you know, if we're doing a second show without, you know, a third show without an audience, why don't we drop the second show, and just do one for an audience, and then you can take your time and do so that it it evolved to that stage uh about five or six weeks into the season as i said danny was a perfectionist every script ended up on his desk and he f did the fine tuning to make sure that it was right so we would sit down at the beginning of a reading and have half a script we'd only have the first act uh, and he'd tell us how it's going to end because they were still working on the second act. So we were, when we started rehearsing, we didn't even have a whole script. Pages would come down regularly. Uh, at, at, uh, at, so in about the sixth or seventh week or so, I don't, we got to a point where uh, we didn't have the whole script and it was time to camera block. And we didn't know whether, or even I think it was at, at the camera blocking day, we didn't have the whole, didn't have the last scene. And you can't do a show for an audience if you don't have the last scene. So he canceled the audience and we continued on and did it without an audience live, uh, you know, in, in sequence. And then he redid it. This his way with the bringing the cameras around, make sure he had every shot he wanted. Well, the people who get audiences were not too thrilled with that. You just you can't do that. <laughs> you have to tell us today whether you're going to have an audience on Thursday, and he wasn't sure, so he said no. And we never had an audience again, because first of all, it gave him an extra day to fiddle with the, with the words to make sure that he had the script the way he wanted it. Uh, what happened was we, f we started doing it exactly the same way. We would do a, a show and then, then finally he said, look, we're doing it that we realized, let's put it this way, that camera blocking day is essentially teaching the cameras where to go so that you could do it live in front of an audience. If you don't have an audience, you don't really need a camera blocking day. Just start with the second show that we're doing. Do it, it'll take a little longer to do it. And that's what we ended up doing eventually. We just had, uh, actually it was a four day schedule. We just did two days of rehearsal. And then we come in the third day, get in the makeup and start doing what we did. And as the papers came down, we would stage it and shoot it and 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 that so that was really how we ended up doing it. It was really like a one camera show with multi cameras. Um, for some reason though, because as I said in the beginning, we always did that third show, it was like two two o'clock in the morning before we finished. As we eliminated piece by piece, for some reason it still took till two o'clock in the morning. We were 
notorious. We uh, one night, one night we went to about seven o'clock in the morning. And the reason is, he would not let go until it was what he thought was proper, what he thought would work with the show. It was purely an exercise in approaching his concept of perfection. It was tiring, but you couldn't fault him because you were part of making something better, you know? So uh, we just got used to it. That's the way we worked. We started on Wednesday morning and we never finished till two o'clock Thursday night. As a theater actor, did you miss having a live audience? You know, that's a very interesting question. The year that he, uh, I did the first pilot for Barney, I was offered another show. I can't remember the name of it, but it was a, a one hour cop show. And I chose Danny's show because it had a live audience. Because I thought as a theater actor, I would be more comfortable dealing with that audience. I was very quickly disabused of that. Because in the very first episode, I would be opening up the scene to the audience, you know, and the cameraman kept saying, hey, we're over here. <laughs> and I finally realized that my audience was not out there in the stands, my audience was behind that camera. That I had to, this was still a cinematic acting job, not a stage acting job. Uh, eventually, I recognized, at least for Barney Miller, that it was better without an audience for a couple of reasons. Uh, the truth of the matter is, particularly on the, in the, uh, with the uh, weekly performers, people who come and play one part in one episode, when you sit down and read it, you know where the laughs are. Well, if you go in front of an audience and you do the scene and they don't laugh, the implication is that you didn't do it right because you've got to laugh in the reading, it's a funny line. And so most, many, many weekly actors with an audience would make sure they got the laugh and the laugh became more important than the scene. Uh, so there's a lot of over, overdoing that, when, that goes on when you do a show in front of an audience. In most sitcoms, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, it is a little over the top, it is a little over. But Barney was not that way. Barney had a reality grit that you had to maintain. Yes, there were comedic perps and complainers and people who came to, you know, into the, but we had to be within, again, the, that limitation bar, that Danny set. Would you go for help to somebody who behaves like that? And so we had to maintain this, you know, play it like a, a real detective story. It was easier to do without the audience. We could stay in character, the characters that we dealt with never overacted because of that, because, you know, you're now in here. You're not showing the whole stage. So I think it was, for Barney, a boon that we ended up doing it uh, with our audience. You mentioned some of the character Barney Miller's strengths, but what do you think his weaknesses were? Vanity. I gave him vanity. I put that in. I, you're always looking for something to, you know, he was uncomfortable, you know, he didn't want anybody to know he was, was wearing glasses, you know. 
occasionally wore an ex extra, got up dressed in a suit and nobody noticed and it was really disturbing to him, things like that, you know. I just, you know, as you go along, you try to find chinks in the armor to, that give it what? Color. Yeah. Um, in what but he was a good family man, and I think he was a fair man. He recognized the insanity of life, that was the point, and tried to make sense out of it, and tried to run a, an organization that made sense out of it, was the point. Uh, accommodating of other people's frailties and flaws, uh, maybe a little too good for to be human, you know. But that's why I used to put in all these little, you know, colors, little chinks in his armor. In what ways were you, Hal Linden, like him, and what ways are you different? I think I think Hal Linden would love to have been Barney. Hal Linden is much more, much less organized as a human being, much less, uh, much more uh, swayed by, you know, things that are going around me. Uh, not nearly in, as in charge a human being as, as Barney was. No, no, no. I, I aspired to Barney, but uh, and hopefully, my wife always said that I brought my roles home with me. I played, uh, you know, on Broadway, I played the devil, I played uh, Maya Rothschild, I played all kinds of characters, and every, but she always said, you always brought a little bit of a bit of it home, you know. Uh, and I, I, I hope I brought Barney home. Um, how do you think he evolved over the course of the show? I don't think there was a major change in Barney. I think he became more, more confident and more vain and more, more of everything as it went on, you know. And uh, I think he also reached out for the reins a little bit more, uh, if anything, uh, to make sure that things went right, you know, they didn't go crazy. But he had such a uh, uh, laissez-faire attitude toward other people's behavior, I mean, that he could sit and listen to the inspector go on and on without saying anything. You know, he would be a part of it and, because he knew he was, the inspector was lonely, he needed people to talk to, so, you know. He, that, that, I think that was the aspect of Bonnie that I loved, was this acceptance of everybody, you know. And maybe a, maybe a little of that snuck into my, uh, to me, I don't know. Um, do you know where the name Barney Miller came from? Uh, I know the Barney part. The Bar uh, Barney part was, uh, was uh, named after a detective named Barney Ruditsky. Uh, I guess they figured that was a little too ethnic. He was a famous New York, uh, uh, detective, I don't know about him, but Danny mentioned him to me once. I, I, I never really, but he was out of a different context. He was he was a detective. He was not a a captain, so um, you know it didn't really affect me that much. But I know that's where Danny got the name. Um, let's talk about your castmates. Uh -huh. So um, we'd love to talk about both the actor and your relationship with them and the character, and Barney's relationship to the character, so I can run through a list of people and make sure we get everybody. Okay. Um, so I have let's to be honest about this? Yes. I have to be honest about this, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, let's start with Max Gale. Max. Max was, uh, I first saw Max Gale uh, long before Barney. Well, not long, but three, three years before Barney in a production of uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in, uh, uh, San Francisco while I was doing the Rothschilds up there. So I had met him before. Again, these were second cast numbers. 
The original cast member, oh, the uh, names, oh, God, you'd have to look him up for me, uh, was a very good actor who had been turning to directing and was not available for the second uh, pilot, and that's when they hired Max. Max, uh, again, was a beginning actor. He was a musician. He was a piano player. A beginning actor who knew he was a beginning actor and was very open to learning it, learning how to do it. And, and, and uh, this concept of being open to learning is really what gave uh, the character his uh, scope. Originally, it's intent, he was supposed to be the, uh, I think in the original pilot, he was the one who pulled out the guns first. He was ready to go and go shooting. You know, he was, he was, you know, some sort of Polish joke, I guess, of the the big guy who just big and bluff and 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 was you know face out there. But but Max was so incredibly vulnerable and open that they ended up writing into it. He was the guy who discovered that New York did not have a. Uh, 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 a plan for people to, um, to, to escape in case of there was, there was no municipal plan for, uh, what do you call it, getting out of town, you know, in case of a, you know, but only because Max himself was so open to learning and that, that he defined his own character that way. It was much more interesting than just being the obvious, you know, heavy, not heavy, uh, what, what am I saying, the kind of oafish guy that I think was originally written. He became the wide-eyed naif, if you will. And, uh, and through that, we were able to investigate all kinds of weird, wonderful uh, adventures. Max himself is just, that, was, is just that kind of guy. He kept, he was open to all kinds of experiences he's still t that way today if you really know Max and what was Barney's relationship with Wojo father son father son because of this uh, uh, childlike quality I, I, I don't know if there's a better word for it I'm sure but the, the fact you know that the, the desire to learn um, the most, uh, the, 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 uh, what's the word, quintessential scene between us took place in probably the show that caused Barney to be successful. It was very slow. We were not a top 10 show. We never were. But we were really low in the ratings in the beginning. Did we? They did a show where uh, Wojo falls in love with a hooker, falls for a hooker, let's put it this way, and his way of keeping her from doing her trade is to constantly bust the entire house. So you have all these ladies standing around in a victimless cr crime as far as Barney is concerned, but he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to put the kibosh on. You know, eventually he's, he, he uh, has a scene, I believe, where he says, come on now, we can't, we got important things to worry about. Uh, and eventually, he confronts the girl and asks her for a date, to which she says, okay, just like everybody else, 50 bucks. I mean, that was <laughs> a long time ago, <laughs> 50 bucks, it, which is, of course, devastating to him. I mean, and we have at the end of the show, and he finally lets them all go, this father-son talk about how you, can, you can't control other people's behavior. You can only control your own and how you react to it. And you have to decide how you feel about it and react that way and go about your life. Uh, very paternal, you know, and he, He's really destroyed by this whole thing. 
And as he walks out the door, he turns to me and says, by the way, Bonnie, can you lend me 50 bucks till payday? Which, of course, was the, where the entire show was going to that line, at which point the network said, you can't say that line. Whoa, the entire show is building up to this last line at the, you know, before he walks out the door. So they have this big, now we have started to shoot the show. And they're in the office, network, the network, uh, what do they call it, continuity? What is it, the, 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 what they call censors? Right, standards. <laughs> standards and practices, right. And they're fighting over whether he can say this line or not. Now this is only about the seventh show, eighth show? Fifth. Fifth, fifth even earlier. It wasn't on the air, we weren't, we, we didn't have big numbers, we weren't star, you know? We were really just clawing our way onto the schedule. And the network, you can't say that. Why not? Well, that means he's gonna go with the girl. And then he said, very astute of you, you figured it out, how about that? I'm sure the audience will get that message too. Well, you can't, you know. Well, they were, they're arguing upstairs and we're shooting and we finally get to the last scene. The director calls up and says, Danny, what do we do? I mean, I, could you give me a different line? How would the show would have just petered out if he just walked out? Danny says, shoot it. Hangs up, turns to the network and says, I'm shooting it the way I wrote it. It's up to you if you put it on the air. But if you don't, I'm not going to make any more. I mean, can you imagine the brass? This is not a hit show. This is a fledgling. And he had the guts to say, this is, we're shooting our shows the way we wrote them. This is 1970s, you know, this is not today where, uh, you know, Broadway Empire has nude scenes, uh, Boardwalk Empire, you know, you, you, this was, even network today is. And we shot it. Uh, two, two affiliates did not sh would not show it because it was released, believe it or not, with an X rating. They, in the beginning of the show, there was an X and, and the card said, material may be unsuitable for whatever, I don't know, however they word that. And that's the way it was shown. Now, needless to say, it got into the press that there was a, an episode that was not gonna be shown in two places and they were gonna show with an X, which, I don't have to tell you, did wonders for the rating. <laughs> but it was, it was uh, the guts on that man to s say this is what we're doing and this is the way we're gonna do it. Uh, and that was the same with Max, that was that. Uh, and that was really the turning point that all of a sudden people were turn, tuning in the show to, to see what we we're going to do next. Was but it only the fifth show? That's wow. what it said in the. It might. It might have been seventh because of the pilots. Oh, all right. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, That's it's, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that would make sense. I know it had been on the air for only about three or four weeks when this happened, and we didn't have ratings that you could call. Uh, oh, we got a hit here. We were sliding in there down somewhere in the 70s I don't know uh, let's talk about Ron Glass um, determined actor determined knew exactly what he wanted to do and accomplished all of it uh, didn't brook um, uh, criticism or anything he knew in charge, well uh, trained actor, uh, Guthrie Theater, you know, I mean, this was not somebody who just looked the part. This is somebody who had stature as an actor. Um, 
I will never forget. Uh, some years into the run, I directed a couple of the, sh of the shows. And one scene I directed was with uh, Dietrich and, uh, and a, a, a lady who had come to, to uh, uh, she'd been mugged or something. And it was a simple scene that I was really working on to try to, to get it to work. And when it finally worked, I realized that Ron was sitting at the other table listening to this scene because it was about, she, he had known her in high school or something. And I gave them a backstory that made it very sexual and very sensual, you know, so that this, whatever they said was just dripping with. And I noticed Ron working at his desk, <laughs> listening and, and reacting to everything. And I couldn't help, I said, after it was all over, he shot the whole thing, I said, one more shot, one more time. And I put the cameras on, on Ron and picked up his reactions. I said, well, we gotta cut those in somewhere. It was, it was just, um, but the word I would give, give, uh, give to, about Ron is uh, sure of himself and uh, self-assured, self self-assured, very self-assured man. And what was Barney's relationship with Harris? Uh, Barney suffered Harris. Harris had an enormous ego, if you remember correctly. He was writing the great American novel, <laughs> Blood on the Badge, I think it was called. And, uh, but Barney suffered him gladly, you know, because he was, I think, with all the detectives, Barney was comfortable that they were good detectives. That was the point. And so he would cater to their whims and their eccentricities and keep it all in order. But uh, Ron had the, uh, Ron was the only one who had costumes, you know, he kept, well, he always had new coat, new jacket every week and uh, his hairdo changed and whatnot, you know, there was always that, the, the element of um, self was always evident in his character, which was, was wonderful, you know, lovely colors. Uh, talk about Gregory Sierra. Gregory left the show early. Gregory it was probably the one person that I couldn't uh, deal with. Uh, I obviously must have done something that annoyed Gregory. And he always, I always had the feeling that I was on trial with Gregory. I don't know. Um, So uh, there, there was a very, uh, honestly, I, I, I loved him as an actor. He was wonderful. He had this terrific, I thought it was a wonderful color for the show, but I just could not seem to, not, not the character, but, I, but Gregory himself, I could not seem to uh, interact with him uh, in a positive way. I got along with everybody else, I thought, you know. You know, it's an uncomfortable situation. You're the straight man, really. They're all get, getting all the laughs. I'm just reacting. And yet my name is on the title. So it was a kind of a weird relationship with everybody to begin with. Also, I had just come from Broadway. I was a big Tony Award winning star. I was the star of the show. But it was not. It was a gang comedy. It's a very, you know, it's a possibly the greatest ensemble cast ever assembled when you think about how good they were. And, and, and you try like crazy, and I knew my function had to be to make it as gemütlich as possible, not have, we didn't have too many um, temper tantrums, I don't remember I don't think we ever lost uh, any time over anything, but Gregory and I just never really found each other. And uh, he immediately went to his other, to another show that he was starring in, so we never had to really resolve it. But uh, I always felt, I thought maybe I, maybe I did something that annoyed him or I, 
you know, and, and I could never put my finger on it and fix it. And what was Barney's relationship with Chano like? Well, I really respected Chano because Chano was the was the uh, also somebody who uh, there was one the wonderful episode where Chano shot somebody, and uh, you know that was the one thing about Barney. I know um, Joe Wambaugh, for instance, said it was the best cop, the most realistic cop show. Realistic. Not only the best, but the most realistic. And the rationale being that if you ask, uh, 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 and I did many times, I'd ask real detectives, how many times in your career have you fired your weapon in anger? And they would say once or twice or never, because most cop work is grunt work. It's developing sources of information, it's recording the information that you do get, it's disseminating the information. That's really, the, for a detective, that's really what they do. And yet, you know, you would watch a cop show of its time, uh, Kojak, and they're running down alleys, ripping off shots at everybody, you know. It's a traumatic experience to injure someone with a, with a weapon. And Chano had this wonderful scene where he couldn't deal with the fact that he had hurt, hurt somebody. That it, and I went to visit him. I remember the scene, I think it was in his, his house or his door, in his doorway anyway, to try to, you know, not, I couldn't explain but to indicate that he hadn't done anything wrong and that it was his job and he did his job. And uh, how did Danny do it? That this, the largest mammal, I can't remember what it was, has a, has a brain the size of a pea or something. And you know why? Because that's the way it is. <laughs> And that's the way life is, and we have to pick up and move on. Uh, I worked with with Gregory, and I worked with Chano. It was just a personal thing that I never really solved. I guess I'm still trying to figure out what I did wrong. Um, let's talk about Ron Carey. Ronnie was the uh, class clown. Ronnie was the guy who brought in the candy and put out candy, and if anything, if there was a possibility of a joke, Ronnie was standing on, on a, one of the tables doing jokes. Ronnie was a stand-up comic. Ronnie was one of the few stand-up comics who, that is, he started as a stand-up comic. So he was always the class clown, and he played right into the character that he, that, that he created. Uh, you know, to be the trying so hard to, 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 to be like the big guys. And he, the fact that he was tiny in stature helped it, of course, enormously. Yeah. And what did Barney think of Levitt? He, once again, he suffered him gladly. You know, um, there are ways to become a detective. It ain't by hanging around the detectives. <laughs> uh, so he more or less suffered him gladly, as it were. Yeah. Uh, talk about Steve Landisberg. Steve was a replacement when um, when uh, Abe left. Abe left to do his own show, and Steve came in and got that desk. It was a it was a replacement. Steve had been on the show before as a guest star. Uh, and so had Ronnie. So had Ron. Ron played a character, and he I guess Danny loved him so much he wrote him in as a as a regular somebody else. Steve had played a character. And I guess when, when uh, they had to replace uh, Abe, uh, he picked Steve. The interesting part is, I don't know, uh, Steve was a, is a stand-up comic, or was. Uh, it was a stand-up comic, but totally different from the character he played on Barney. He played this marvelous intellectual who saw the 
complexities of every situation and had a punchline for those kids. So he had these marvelous rants where he would go on and on and on and on and then pow, punchline. He had this wonderful uh, continuing uh, character and continuing uh, modus for, for showing the, the humor. Steve, if you ever saw him in concert, was a madman. He was insane. He would do these absolutely weird rants that nothing like the character he played. He himself personally was a very down-to-earth guy. He married late in life and became a terrific father and husband and died way too young. Yeah. And what was Barney's relationship with Dietrich? He recognized Dietrich's mind, his intellect, but he also recognized that he was, we don't have to hear about it all, you know. So he, again, suffered him gladly, I suspect, you know, that, that would be the way that he let him go on and say his whole speech, and then he, he knew there was a punchline, you know. Um, again, Barney was the audience's eye. However the audience was supposed to look at a character, that's how I looked at it. Talk about Jack Sue. Jack was a um, old friend of Danny's. Jack and Danny had, when they first got in, in, in the late 40s, uh, Danny Arnold was a stand-up comic and Jack Sue was a singer. Jack Sue was billed as the Chinese Bing Crosby. Jack was a singer. He, uh, he did uh, Flower Drum Song, the movie. He was terrific. Uh, and they toured together in uh, little uh, American Legion posts in tiny towns. Uh, so they knew each other way back when. Jack had been involved with Danny, I think, when Danny was a producer on uh, Wacky Ship, was it? Uh, a prior... Um, anyway, J uh, Jack was a later addition. What happened was the original guy who sat at that desk was, I don't remember his name, was Italian. And he would have been hired again to do the second pilot, but he had appeared in, an, in a porno picture um, behind the green door or one of those, he had a part in, it wasn't a, he didn't do any porno stuff, but he had appeared in a picture with, with a porno star and the network put the gibosh on him because they, uh, you know, everybody was scared in those days of uh, anything to do with that. And so uh, Jack did the second of the, sec of the, not the second pilot, but the second episode. He wasn't in the first one. And, uh, and Jack was a, was a power unto himself. Now, when Jack died, there was a big question about how they were going to handle it. He died in, what, the second year, third year? Third year. Third year, I think. So, he, you know, this was relatively early in our, in our run. There was a, uh, a faction that said, write a script, because he had been gone for about five weeks. He was in the hospital, but according to the uh, show, he was at the district attorney's office. He was in, could have written a script in where we find out that he never was at the district attorney's office, that he was sick, he didn't want anybody to know about it, only I knew. There were all kinds of ideas about how they were gonna handle the character dying. And when we came in that Monday morning, we, we didn't know what we were going to find. And then he met with us and said, I'm not going to trade on the death of Jack. We're not going to write it in. We're going to do a clip show. And we did a marvelous, he said to each of us, sit down and write something you'd like to say about your relationship with Jack. Whatever you'd like to say and we'll intersperse them with clips. And that's the way we did it. We sat at the desk, 
and I introduced myself as Hal Linden, and that Jack Sue, who plays Nick Yamana, would normally be sitting here, but unfortunately, Jack died. Uh, and we'd like to remind you of some of the wonderful things that Jack created on this show and to tell you how we feel about it. And that was the, that was the show. It was an amazing experience to do. I'll tell you what I'd said, because I'd remembered this. I said, Jack Sue had a Chinese name. Sue is Chinese. It was a phony name. His real name was Goro Suzuki. Jack was Japanese and was in an internment camp in Utah for the beginning of World War II. And the only way he got out of that internment camp was to enlist in the army. And he went to Italy and fought in the army with the Japanese regiment that, that came from the internment camps. Now, you would not fault Jack for having a certain amount of bitterness for what he endured, but you never saw it in Jack. Jack handled it all with humor. Anytime anything got testy, Jack was funny. Jack was a very funny, personally funny man, and he, he never, you, at least I never saw it, never saw any bitterness toward, from, from anything that he had to endure uh, to become Jack Sue. The fact of the matter is that when he got out of the army and tried to have a career, he knew that if his name was Jack Suzuki, that was in 1946 or seven, that was not exactly a great stage name. And that's when he chose Sue and called himself the Chinese Bing Crosby, knowing full well that Americans couldn't distinguish between Japanese and Chinese. And so he played into it, he used it, but that was Jack. He was one of the most naturally funny human beings you ever saw. And talk about his character. The character, the character was, uh, I guess, part Danny, part Jack, part, uh, you know, first of all, to make him a gambler. J Jack was a gambler. Uh, to make him the creator of the terrible coffee we had to drink. Um, Jack was probably the least detective-like when you think about it. But there was a kind of a, I looked on Jack, on his character, the same way Danny looked on Jack, knowing his kind of marvelous free humor that would, that it, it would always find its way out. So he was kind of a, uh, you know, again, suffered and gladly, okay. But, it was, but I was always looking to see what he was going to say that was going to be funny because I knew that the next thing out of his mouth would be, would be a, an arch view, a very arch view of the reality that we have in, in this country, including his background, knowing where it came from. Did he improvise at no. all? When you have scripts like that, there was no need to improvise. A lot of it came up in the beginning because in the beginning we would, as I say, all these creative actors would sit around and come up with funny stuff. Listen, if I do this, you could do that. And if I say this, you could say that. And then he would go, no, too big, smaller, and came up with this uh, limitation that that we all finally realized. So there was v almost no ad-libbing. There may have been a paraphrase or two, but there was no, no, we didn't have to. Those scripts were too strong, too good. And they didn't, they didn't have jokes in them. If you watch it, Danny used to cut the punchlines of jokes because you didn't need it. You would say the 
straight line set up the situation, and everybody knew what was coming next. You just cut to a reaction, and 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 that you didn't even have to say the punchline. So it was all character stuff, and that, that comes from writing. You don't ad lib character stuff. Yeah, you know, colors sometimes, but uh, uh, very little uh, ad libbing on that show. Too, the scripts are too good. So talk about Abe Vigoda. Abe, Abe is a unique. Abe is unique. Abe uh, interviewed for the part of the Italian who sat at that desk. He was just off Godfather. He was uh, Tessio. You know, he was the, quote, quintessential Italian. He was going to play the part of the Italian guy. I can't remember the name of the character or the actor. I'm sorry. Danny took one look at him and said, uh, no, I think I got something else for you. <laughs> and Danny just saw what that face could do and created every situation that, that uh, you know, set him up magnificently. Now, if you remember, he sat in the front desk, sitting downstage, which means that every time he shot a reaction shot from him, that was a pickup because you couldn't get a camera on stage shooting out. They had a false wall they put behind him and they shot all his reaction shots. Basically, that's all Danny needed because most of his stuff was rea was just a reaction. You just cut to him, he'd give you that look, and and you knew what we what he was thinking or what. Uh, he uh, his character was a creation of Danny Arnold. Danny Arnold created that character. He used what he saw. He used that expressive that face, that deadpan, that you know. And 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 he uh, he he treated uh, Abe as the, the 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 cherry on the pie. Whenever he needed that one moment, he would write that in and shoot it. And that you know you knew it was it was solid. Uh, Abe, I knew Abe before, and Abe and I were the only two from the original pilot. I'll tell you when we <laughs> when we came out to do the original pilot. Now Abe was uh, he wasn't that old. He only looks old. Uh, he's about 10 years older than me, that's all. And uh, so we did a, um, they wanted to did a, a, a press thing where we went to a gym together. We were working out together. And they took pictures of us walking on the machines and doing weights and whatnot. And, they, uh, and Abe said, I used to play a little Handball. They had a three, a four, you know, an indoor handball court with. The, you want to play a little handball? I said, All right, I'll play handball. He killed me. He killed me. I, I don't think I got a point. He was, he was so good at it. And uh, again, by that, even by that time, he was, you know, he wasn't a, a, a kid. He wasn't as old as he looked, but he wasn't a kid. But he was in great shape. He was. He moved around that court. He he killed me. I attended his ninetieth birthday. He's about ninety-two now, I think. And uh, it's kind of. He's still Abe. He's still Abe. We have to stop and change tapes. <laughs> okay.